welcome again, and welcome especially to our folks in Saskatoon and on Treaty 6 lands there. I'm Cheryl Camillo, an assistant professor here at Johnson Shoyama and a veteran of Obamacare wars in the United States. And I was uh, uh, talking when you couldn't hear us about the, the three reasons we thought that it was important to have this discussion here in Saskatchewan. One is just to provide an update to Canadians who, are, who follow the U.S. health care system very closely on the latest, and Ruth and Johanna have come with good information. Two, and this is because we're a school of public policy, is to identify and examine how there are issues that underlie policy debates, especially sensitive policy debates, and then talk about how to address those issues. Because my argument here today that you'll hear me express is that uh, one reason debates like Obamacare get stalled is that people don't deal with the real issues that are underlying the debates, but, at, but are only debating issues on the surface of those. Uh, so the agenda today will be, and um, uh, one point about updates on Obamacare and why um, they could be of interest to folks here in Canada, especially those working in the Canadian health system, and I see we have folks here who at least, if not working at the ministry today, have worked there in the past, is um, Obamacare did, among other things, provide a lot of incentive, including financial incentive, to experiment with different models for delivering and paying for health care. And those are models that Canadian health officials are very interested in. And there's now a threat to the testing of those models um, that was recently issued via policy by the Trump administration. So I think that's of interest here. And this piece I published in Policy Magazine last year talks about how, the, how and why those delivery system models might be of interest to provincial health systems. So the agenda is, I will do a brief overview of the U.S. healthcare system and changes that Obamacare made to that system and the current state. And then I will offer some insights into these underlying issues from my own experiences working within the U.S. And then we'll ask Ruth and Johanna to offer insights as well as updates on what's going on in the U.S. now. As I alluded to when I introduced myself, I've worked with both Ruth and Johanna for many years. I'm really excited that they braved the change in temperature to come up here, um, because I think they have a, a lot that is really valuable to share in person. Ruth is a, quite the living legend in U.S. healthcare. She just retired after 37 years in in service to the state of Louisiana, her home state, where she started in local eligibility offices and rose to be the director of the, the Medicaid program, which is the main public health insurance program. Among her many accomplishments are greatly expanding eligibility in that state for low, in, low and middle income children. And, and I think we could probably credit you directly for maybe a million people in Louisiana being covered that wouldn't be covered if it weren't for you. And also for bringing managed care to Louisiana, which was a state that previously only had a fee-for-service medical system in its public health insurance. So two major feats. And she's now working as a consultant, as is Johanna Barraza Cannon who I first knew when we worked at this, the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the U.S., which is the main public health insurance agency. She was in charge of policy for the Children's Health Insurance Program. After that, left to run an Office of Health Information Technology for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and recently did a seventh month stint as interim Medicaid director for the state of South Dakota before returning to consulting. And then joining online, you heard his voice, is Danielle Bellon, who, our Canada Research Chair in Policy, who really doesn't need an introduction from me. I think most people will know him. He's authored 16 books, including Obamacare Wars, which I think he'll talk about when he speaks. And Oh, I think he's uh, brought 120 peer-reviewed articles on health politics and social politics, if, uh, social policy politics, if not more. Um, so um, 
I want to now give an overview of the U.S. healthcare system. This was the system pre-Affordable Care Act, and I, I see some amused looks and laughs from the audience. It's a pretty complex healthcare system. There's a similar publication for Canada that has a chart similar to this that displays the Canadian health system, and it's much, much simpler than this figure. Briefly, the way the system works, and the system was developed at the same time the Canadian healthcare system was in the mid 60s. In the US, you first um, uh, see if you're eligible for private health insurance. When private health insurance is available, it's usually available through employers, although fewer and fewer employers are now providing it. If you can't get it from an employer, you can seek it on the individual market. It's very costly either if you get it through employers or through the individual market, even with some assistance that's now provided, even though employers do pay part of the premiums. For those um, who don't have a very comprehensive private health insurance coverage, there is public health insurance coverage. That's what you see on the left of the screen, uh, to your left. Uh, and. I'll focus on three of the main public health insurance programs. There's a Medicare program, which is a social insurance program that individuals pay into. It's for retired individuals ages 65 and up, as well as disabled individuals. We won't talk much about that program today. We're going to talk about the two others, which are Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, which we'll call CHIP. Medicaid is a program that was initially f funded, it's run by the federal government and each of the states. Like the program, the, the health system here, the states have the option to choose to run it, if all of them now do, and they get support, financial support from the federal government. Initially, it was only for individuals receiving welfare. Uh, so people with, poor people with very low income levels, if any income at all. Over the 70s, especially the 80s, it was expanded to people with slightly higher incomes, um, but still low-income individuals. Because there were still many people in the U.S. who didn't have private health insurance and didn't qualify for Medicaid, there were many uninsured individuals, which you see as the box on your far right. Congress acted with President Bill Clinton in the late 90s to create the CHIP program to cover children with slightly higher incomes than the Medicaid level. So lower middle class children became eligible under the CHIP program. And um, despite that, the uninsurance levels, which you see here, um, were still quite high throughout the 2000s. And when the Great Recession hit the United States, which hit with much more force than it hit in Canada in December of 2007, the uninsured rates, an insurance rate started to peak again. Ruth and I were both working at the state level at the time, and I can tell you the impact was sudden where we literally had lines around the corner of our eligibility offices of people waiting to apply for Medicaid and CHIP. And the uninsurance rate went up to over 18 percent, so one in every five Americans was without health insurance of any kind. And this is for a whole year, not just at any given point in time. At the same time, there was a presidential election, the 2008 presidential election, and so health care became an issue in that debate again, also because the cost was increasing. While this graph shows 2013 data, the same relative um, statistics were true in 2008, which is in the U.S., the health care amounted for almost 20 percent of all uh, the value of all goods and products produced in the United States, otherwise known as GDP. So almost one in every five dollars in the U.S. compared to uh, other Western industrialized nations um, <coughs> under the OECD where the average was less than 10 percent, the most being about 11 percent in Switzerland after the U.S. So between the rising costs, which weren't only cost to governments but cost to individuals, and the uninsurance rate, 
it became an issue in the campaign after President Obama won and came into office in January 2009. There was a year-long series of debates about how to reform the health care system that included town meetings and, and discussion in many, many different forms and went through procedures in Congress before finally in March of 2010 on a party line vote the Affordable Care Act was adopted and uh, adopted by both chambers of the US Congress and enacted by President Obama on March 23, 2010. And it was a major piece of legislation um, and what it did the, the main pieces, it was a, literally a thousand page piece of legislation about this thick, but the main features which we will then talk about today are it first mandated that states greatly expand the Medicaid program to cover all adults um, with at least all poor adults as well as some with lower middle class incomes. And it offered it, it mandated that states create health insurance exchanges now known as health insurance marketplaces in conjunction with the federal government that could provide subsidized private health insurance to individuals who made too much money, had too much income to get Medicaid, didn't have health insurance from their employers, um, and needed to get health insurance. And for, for middle class and um, income um, individuals and below there were subsidies from the government. To make sure that people were availing themselves of those opportunities, there was also a health insurance mandate that imposed a penalty through our tax system for any individual who did not go and seek insurance through Medicaid or those health insurance marketplaces. There were other provisions in the 900 pages to address, to try to address cost issues in the U.S. healthcare system as well as hundreds of pages of provisions to address the quality of care. I mentioned that there, were, there, were, uh, there, were, there was funding for testing of programs to, to, to pay for health care in different ways to encourage providers to improve quality and, and increase cost efficiency. And that was through the creation at the Centers for Medicare and Mer Medicaid Services where Johanna and I worked of a Center for Innovation Policy. And you see that the yellow areas are where the changes were implemented. Here's a list um, of what I've just described. I will only add that some of the provisions also addressed the comprehensiveness of coverage for individuals so that there would be more comprehensive health care packages. And there was elimination of some provisions that, in effect, restricted access, such as lifetime limits in the amount of health care you could receive or annual limits in the amount of health care that you could receive under a private insurance plan which really did hinder access for many people. All these provisions were in this according to the statute supposed to go into effect sometime between 2010 and 2014 with the act being fully in effect on January 1, 2014. Danielle may mention that and he mentions this in his book, literally five minutes after the president signed the bill, there were lawsuits filed by over half of the states. And the result of the lawsuit working its way up to the US Supreme Court is that the Medicaid expansion I mentioned, which was initially mandatory, became optional for states to implement. So initially in 2014, only 26 states, so just about half of the states, implemented that Medicaid expansion. <coughs> this map shows that since 2014, another seven or so have. They're the blue states that you see there. Um, the, when President Obama left office, his Council of Economic Advisors issued a report evaluating the, the impacts of the Affordable Care Act. and. It, as you can see in the graph that I showed with the uninsurance rates, sorry to have to go back here, the uninsurance rate plummeted as a result of the Affordable Care Act to 10.4% in 2016. And 
the copious amount of research that's been done on the other effects on quality and access have shown that it had very positive effects on access to services for those who did get insurance and some positive although mixed effects on cost to individuals as well as cost to to others for for insurance and services and now we uh, um, I can't believe I've gone about 20 minutes without saying uh, the words um, I think I said Trump administration once um, we are in an era that the Congress under uh, the president's um, guidance and, and um, direction and I'll put that in quotation marks has been seeking to, uh, the majority in the Republican Party has been seeking to re repeal and replace Obamacare so far not successfully um, but it sounds like from statements that have been made over the last week or two they're going to continue these efforts after pursuing tax reform so we will see what happens um, what we know for sure is there's going to be a, l a loud debate I think and a, and one with many differing opinions and so now I want to transition and just offer some insights into what I think um, is underlying that debate the first thing I want to go to and I gave a preview of this slide is in that one year period I mentioned when the Affordable Care Act was being developed as the president was traveling the country holding town meetings he held a joint session of Congress, which is relatively rare in the United States that a president will convene Congress to speak to them. It's almost like a special throne speech here in Canada. And the focus was only on health care. And an unusual event happened. I think it was relatively unprecedented in the U.S. where when the president was speaking, one member of Congress, Joe Wilson from South Carolina, shouted out when the president was talking about who might be eligible under uh, the, the, the proposed policies, shouted out, you lie. And what he was specifically saying was the president had just said that illegal immigrants would not be covered under any of the policies. And it evoked this response. And I think that's really important to pay attention to. There's this strong undercurrent uh, in the US of anxiety about immigrants, particularly illegal immigrants or what we officially call non-qualified aliens from getting any public subsidy for health insurance. Uh, another anecdote I can share is Johan and I had the responsibility of, I don't think it was a pleasure, back in the mid-2000s, we had to write a report to Congress on how, and you saw the uninsurance rates back then, how Congress could expand access to health insurance for migrant farm workers in the U.S. There are many states where there's significant populations of migrant farm workers, many of whom, not all, but many of whom come from other countries. And in the process of writing this report, we had a meeting one day with a political appointee from the Bush administration. And Johanna, I, and the third person who was writing this report were sitting around a table in her office where she started literally to rant about pregnant women terrorists coming to the U.S. to have their babies. Um, there wasn't much we could do but look at each other in that meeting, but uh, there, there was just a remarkable amount of passion in this political appointee's voice just convinced that health care reform, any reform to the system to, to expand insurance coverage would, would somehow be fostering illegal immigration and the receipt of those services. This I wanted to show you in the state of Maryland, r right during that great dis recession, I went to implement, um, before the Affordable Care Act was, pays, uh, was, uh, was adopted, basically what became the model for the Medicaid expansion in the Affordable Care Act. And in the state of Maryland, we provided our Medicaid health insurance to individuals through managed care companies. So 80 to 90 percent of our enrollees actually are members of a private or nonprofit managed care plan. We as the state would pay the managed care plan a certain payment a month to then provide services to our beneficiaries. There were eight plans. This is an email from one of them, United Healthcare, to a member of my staff. United Healthcare is a huge company in the U.S., one of the biggest companies in the U.S., I think. 
And what this email shows is it was looking at from September 2007 to October 2007 what percentage of our caseload was enrolled in United Healthcare versus the other plans. So you could see Amerigroup and um, Johns Hopkins and the, their names. And that percentage dropped in one month from 20.7% to 20.6%, which, which resulted in United contacting me and literally taking two weeks of my time and the time of a division director I assigned to work on this issue to convince them that somehow we hadn't gone into the system to change the algorithm so that United wasn't getting assigned fewer of our beneficiaries than they used to be assigned. They were convinced that we had rigged <coughs> algorithm against them. We were able to show them data that proved that we did not do that. But my greater point here is that something that also underlie, underlies this debate is the amount of money and profit that can be found in the U.S. healthcare system. Certainly in a, in a country with a $3 trillion budget where almost one of every five of those dollars is devoted to health care, there's a lot of money there. And United was expressing its concern that it was losing just a little bit of that money. And they have enough power as a stakeholder in the U.S. healthcare system where I had to spend two weeks of my time addressing that concern. Um, here's another issue which um, we like to chuckle when we see this. When the president was, President Obama was doing his tour, doing his town meetings, he was often met by protesters outside saying, keep the government out of my Medicare and out of my Medicaid, which are government-run health insurance programs. <laughs> we, we all chuckled because there was a certain amount of ignorance here. Um, and it is funny, but it also is a, it's a concern. And I would argue one of the issues that, again, keeps the debate from going forward is that Americans don't even understand how the system is funded. And, but I, I think there's something else here, which is, I mentioned Medicare is a social insurance system. The way individuals pay into that is 7% of your pay, whether you get paid weekly or monthly, goes right into a special trust fund that's run federally uh, by a board of trustees. And eventually, if you become eligible for Medicare because you're 65 or you're disabled, um, that trust fund is what pays for your medical care. But there's not a specific account for Cheryl Camillo or Ruth Kennedy or Johanna. It's a, it's a typical social insurance program. And I think individuals like this gentleman somehow believe that others are tapping into their special account of a trust fund, which, which is the way they think of it, that is taking from the money they put into the trust fund. Um, I'll share one other story before, I, I'm sure Ruth will have good stories to share, and, and, and along similar lines, when I was at the state level, I was responsible, my office was responsible for responding to any letters or calls that came into any level of state government, whether it was our governor, who's our premier, his office, our minister, secretary's office, about people seeking health insurance. And I, and I would, my staff would respond to these letters. I would sign the letters. And I would, be, I would read the incoming letter as I was signing the letter that would respond. And it was fascinating to me. I saw this, and I'd be interested to, see if, to, to know if you saw this as well as in Louisiana and South Dakota. Every incoming letter, even though they came from all parts of our state, and our state was very diverse. We had mountainous regions, we had ocean, we had big cities. Um, every letter said the same thing. It, the first paragraph said, I'm desperate for health care, give me free health care. The second paragraph explained why they were in the state where they needed free health care. They had an injury or something or a bankruptcy. The third paragraph, and this is, this is the point I'm trying to make, the third paragraph always said, always, whether these were handwritten letters in CRAN, some of them were, whether they were typed nicely, always said, I deserve it, nobody else does in the state. Nobody else deserves it, but, but I deserve it, so you should give it to me. And I think in some ways that sign was expressing that notion as well. And I still see that undercurrent being one of the strongest forces that, that, um, that is really affecting this process. 
Ruth, what, what do you hear in Louisiana? Um, if you would put the slide back up uh, with the map, because a picture, uh, you know, they say a picture, um, you know, speaks a thousand words. Um, and so I'm going to uh, refer to that um, a couple of times here as we go forward. Um, all of my experience um, at the state level has been in Louisiana, which is this state right here with the boot. Uh, borders the Gulf of Mexico. And I've been told that the further south you go from the um, Canadian border, the more third world country uh, things become. And that is, uh, these states right here are uh, uh, comprised what is known as the Deep South. Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, the Florida Panhandle, and by the way, I've seen more cotton fields in this Florida Panhandle than I have in uh, Mississippi or North Louisiana, and South Carolina, and East Texas, not, not Arkansas, and East Tennessee, the town of Memphis. So the Deep South is that part of um, the United States that pre-Civil War um, had plantations and um, a, a, a slave society. And so there is a high percentage of African Americans who continue to reside in that area. And there is, um, and in, in all areas, they are the minority, but a large minority, um, you know, as much as a third of the population. But um, much like, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, there is a very much a, a lot of racial animosity um, and, um, in um, the Deep South. Um, if we, in, on this map, um, the states that have expanded Medicaid are in blue, and you see that Louisiana is the only state in the Deep South to expand Medicaid. Now, we were late to the party. We expanded in um, January of 16, two and a half, uh, uh, July, I'm sorry, July of, um, of 2016 when we actually uh, implemented, made the decision in January of 16. So we were two and a half uh, years after the early implementer states. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that, um, uh, why we didn't implement, but also why we are that lone state here in this, uh, this Gulf of uh, Orange states that have not taken advantage of the program. One of the things I think is important to uh, recognize is that um, uh, prior to the Medicaid expansion or the Affordable Care Act, there was huge disparities in coverage for parents. Um, for example, if you were in one of these Midwestern states here, Ohio, actually that borders on Great Lake there, um, is parents um, up to 100% of the federal poverty level uh, could get Medicaid. In Louisiana, it was 11% of the poverty level. I uh, characterized it as you had to be living under a bridge poor in order for a parent to qualify for Medicaid in Louisiana. And even in some uh, South Carolina, uh, Cheryl says she worked with the state to approve it, had some uh, income disregards and were covering parents to 92% of the poverty level compared to 11% in Louisiana. So when you look at um, the, um, the, uh, the lack of health um, equity, uh, access um, um, and uh, in health, um, racial disparities, geographic disparities. Uh, you know that that is uh, that those eligibility limits because um, Medicaid is a state and federal partnership, uh, but the states uh, have a lot of um, decision making. And even though those deep south states get a much higher federal match rate or share um, to pay for health care um, is my opinion is that much of that um, reluctance to be uh, generous in coverage with um, eligibility thresholds is uh, rooted in, in racism. Um, that's just from my experience. But it's not only um, a matter of race. Um, <coughs> in um, the description, it talked about the below the surface uh, issues, politics, misinformation, ignorance, uh, and the American attitudes on race, class, immigration status. And the last one is I want to focus on in, in my remarks is deservedness. 
that's a good word, Cheryl, is um, because that is so much the current uh, discussion in um, this administration, um, uh, the Trump administration, uh, the issue is on the deserving, who deserves to have uh, government-funded health care. So um, a little bit, uh, Louisiana really is a unique state. Uh, so why were we an outlier here? Um, is um, why we share, um, you know, common traits with the other deep south states, Louisiana had a much larger French influence, was part of the French monarchy. And so there is, uh, um, in terms of, so heavily Catholic, rather than and, and less influence of that Puritan ethic and Calvinism and that, you know, you don't work, you know, you don't eat, you don't get any assistance uh, kind of mindset. Um, the, um, and so there was very, the, um, the view of the uh, citizenry that um, the monarch or the governor, or, you know, or the state government uh, had a responsibility to take care um, of its people. So interestingly, you know, uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed uh, the original uh, Medicaid Act in 1965, July of 1965. And it was really like an afterthought to Medicare. Um, and so um, Louisiana was uh, one of the first um, uh, states to implement the original Medicaid program. Uh, within six months of its enactment, um, uh, we had made the decision and, and implemented. Whereas those other deep south states, Georgia came on board a year and a half later. The others were three and a half years after Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, um, uh, before they implemented Medicaid. So that, I think, uh, just is kind of indicative of, um, of that uh, um, phenomenon. Um, so again, I said that the governor uh, of, uh, in Louisiana has great power. What I've seen over the last uh, three, four, five years, time flies, is that there are some governors, um, Republican, conservative governors in states, Tennessee, uh, Florida, um, and then a Democratic governor in um, Virginia who were in favor of expanding Medicaid but were unable to do so because of their legislature. Uh, so the, um, in Louisiana, it was not the legislature they, they're kind of uh, in the middle. Uh, now, there are some far right and a few far left, but they're very much in the middle, and the governor, um, you know, uh, makes a decision. And after that Supreme Court decision uh, that gave states the option to expand Medicaid in um, June of uh, 2012, is the governor of Louisiana at the time. Um, he, is the, he um, is the son of... Um, Immigrants from India, his parents, his mother was pregnant. They came to um, attend Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge when, uh, when she was pregnant with him. And um, he had presidential aspirations. And within one week of the Supreme Court decision, he was like, uh, we will not expand Medicaid. Uh, and he backed himself into a corner because in American politics, there is nothing that is more demonized than a flip-flopper. To so say you're going to do one thing and then uh, change your mind. And so you don't have the right to change your mind or to evolve. Is that is uh, the opposition is going to call you a flip-flopper. So he had backed himself into a corner, even though for the state of Louisiana, his health secretary at the time, um, who um, 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 Joanna and Cheryl both worked with, he had worked at the um, for uh, the federal Medicaid program, um, um, did a whiteboard exercise and showed that no state in America would benefit financially from Medicaid expansion more than Louisiana. Uh, that we, were, we, we would be winners uh, from a state budget perspective. 
But because of that statement he had made, um, is we were we were locked into the counter, and um, we just watched, you know, as the other states, you know, um, were able to um, um, to improve uh, the health and just get the Delta, um, you know, the difference between us and them and the uh, coverage. And uh, make no mistake, y'all, is that Medicaid expansion or the failure to expand Medicaid. I'm not exaggerating or being melodramatic when I tell you it is a matter of life and death. It's having Medicaid, um, having access to health care, um, to be able to um, uh, detect, diagnose uh, cancers earlier rather than later. These make a difference. Uh, we had um, a uh, celebration, um, you know, um, of Medicaid expansion uh, in New Orleans, and um, some of the people who had gotten um, been enrolled um, in Medicaid uh, after the expansion um, in July of 16 spoke. One of them passed out because of she was sick from her chemo from her stage four cancer. Her cancer may have never gotten to stage four if she had had Medicaid um, sooner. So um, th this is um, uh, beyond just the the public health, uh, you know, the the well being of people, the relief of pain and suffering. Um, even if you don't care about that. Louisiana would have saved dollars that were left on the table, state dollars, um, by expanding Medicaid and, and getting that those uh, those federal dollars. So the um, what I see at the federal level, uh, which is in, infecting Louisiana as well, there's a spillover effect, you know, is um, that. Uh, the um, perception, the attitudes about health care, uh, whether, uh, uh, whether it is um, Medicaid or whether it is, um, and even more so for the Medicaid expansion population, is driven by the attitudes that are, um, come from the Elizabethan poor laws. Uh, of 1601 in England, and those were uh, imported to the colonies. Um, and so there was the, the concept of on uh, one side you've got the deserving poor, you've got the undeserving poor. You know, the word, you can call it different for terms, the worthy poor, the unworthy poor, um, the, you know, the, those who are just unfortunate no, due to no fault of their own versus the ones who are irresponsible. Um, in uh, the 1870s uh, in the United States, they were called tramps, and there was a fear of tramps. Um, and then, you know, so there's the, the deserving, um, you know, who are to be pitied, and then they're the ones who are to be blamed. And that uh, this is um, the fact they are, um, this their own lack of ambition, their laziness, um, that their lack of prudence, you know, uh, excess and wasteful. And so uh, Cheryl had mentioned the uh, idea of social insurance for Medicare. Uh, and by the way, as she was talking, it came to my mind, Cheryl, um, you talked about that 7%. Is that an individual mandate? It's a collective mandate. We, I don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. About that 7%. Uh, so there are mandates um, beyond the one that supposedly uh, to have health insurance. It's a mandate to pay for that social insurance. But because they paid in, it's earned. And then you can uh, contrast that with um, what conservatives um, call government giveaways. Uh, you know, a free ride. Nobody wants to see anyone else uh, get a free ride. Um, welfare is demonized, stigmatized. Um, so um, the uh, and back to the um, to touch a little bit more on the, the racial piece of this. Paul Ryan, who um, is the Wisconsin legislator, who is. Um, the Speaker of the House um, in, in, the, in the U.S. Congress. And by the way, his quote that I, is just really for any of us who have, uh, you know, uh, um, devoted ourselves to improving Medicaid and health coverage for people, uh, he is quoted on record as saying, he has been fantasizing about 
block granting or compressing um, the Medicaid program since when? He was going to keg parties in college. Um, so, but his mindset um, very much is driving thinking in the United States. And on a radio show, um, he said um, that a whole generation of men not even thinking about working or learning the value and culture of work. I think he said inner city men. And you may as well say African-American men when you say inner city men. Um, so this is, um, and then um, President Trump talks about <coughs> inner city people. That's his, um, his language as well. So if you look at what states are looking at in the last 12 months since the, um, the last presidential election, it is they're looking to add um, work requirements for, uh, for Medicaid expansion. Now they're not stopping just with that population, they're looking for the traditional um, Medicaid uh, population. Uh, so there is um, Mike Pence, who was the governor of Indiana, uh, they did uh, a program there. And and um, Governor Pence, who is now the Vice President, says, uh, talks about giving Hoosiers, uh, you know, the, uh, the, here's the quote, the dignity. It provides them, they're doing them a favor and giving them dignity by allowing them to pay some kind of premium um, for um, uh, their health insurance. So that's really not difficult to unpack. It's that um, the um, uh, you, you know you're allowing them by them making a premium payment, even though it in all likelihood costs the state of Indiana more to collect that premium. They're there. It's a net loss for them. Uh, in fact, I heard the commissioner uh, of another state that's looking to a Medicaid commissioner who was looking to do um, a premium say when they he he conceded that it would be a uh, net cost to them to administer the premium. But he this is a quote. He said, "But it's worth it." So the. Um, that, that is just uh, the philosophy that we're looking at. So um, as I go to, to, to wrap up um, about this, uh, this work, Seema Verma, who actually worked for Governor Pence in Indiana and is now the head of the, um, the federal Medicaid program uh, in a keynote address uh, at the National Association of Medicaid Directors meeting um, uh, early this month, talked about, she said that not having a work requirement for, um, for the Medicaid uh, program, she, um, she characterized that as the soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, and that is how strongly they feel about this work. Well, here's the 800 pound gorilla in the room, y'all, is most of the uninsured, non-elderly, in fact, the Kaiser Foundation in 2013 said 63%, they were uninsured, but there was someone working full time. That is, there is no correlation between working and having sufficient earnings to pay for health insurance. Or uh, <coughs> to, um, it's just uh, that's just uh, one of those misunderstandings uh, that Cheryl talked about. So elections have consequences. Um, and the, I saw that I uh, went, went through that in the last two years on both. The state level, when we got a new governor, John Bell Edwards was elected in the fall of 15. Uh, he had campaigned y'all throughout the state of Louisiana for two years, and he didn't make any any he didn't pull any punches. He said, "If I'm elected, I'm going to expand Medicaid." Uh, he believed in it. He didn't. He he was not ashamed of the program and Medicaid expansion, and um, he is. Um, uh, has quoted as saying that it was not an issue, Medicaid expansion was not an issue of right versus left, but an issue of right versus wrong. Um, and so um, I believe that as well. And so um, I can take questions out later, Cheryl, that's but right. that's where we that's are. That's right. And that's a great note to end on. Johanna? Morning, everybody. So um, I will try to tie a couple of what you've heard today together into some some points. But 
you know, it struck me having dinner with Cheryl last night and, and in some of the pre-meetings we've had this morning that some of what we're talking about must sound so foreign and bizarre and inefficient to you, which it does to us too, which is that, you know, we've accepted that so many people don't have health insurance, that, um, you know, they have to resort to an emergency room for true emergencies, that they don't receive preventive care, that, you know, there are lots of expenses, that medical bankruptcy is a significant problem in the United States. I told Cheryl that when I was going to the airport yesterday, I rode with a, a Lyft driver um, who gave me his story that he basically lost his coverage somehow through his employer, needed surgery, his wife um, needed a C-section for their third child, and now he's basically in medical bankruptcy, saving up for a home, you know, to, to get a mortgage, and, and $85,000 is just gone for um, a surgery. Uh, and that is what Americans live with, and it is, it is tragic, and it is, it is what part of why I devote uh, my work to health care policy uh, because we have so much inequity um, in the United States. So uh, you might have seen in, in some of the political analysis that right now the U.S. is being viewed as having some of the greatest political divisions that we've had between Republicans and Democrats and social conservatives and liberals and that people seem to be retreating to corners and that there is a lot of divisiveness. Um, and I, I, I think there is, but it's also not new. I think there are some, some philosophies in the United States that, that have gotten us to this point where people can, um, can separate themselves along ideological lines. Um, one of those that you've heard here is that we do not have agreement in the United States about how health care should be delivered or who health care is for. So we don't have an American health law or act that says um, health care is a right, people deserve to have health care, people deserve to, you know, have affordable health care or quality health care. That doesn't exist. Um, so if you talk to someone in America, you're not going to find agreement on that question. You're going to find people who say, absolutely, it's efficient to provide care, preventative care, coverage to people. And you're going to find people who say, like Ruth and Cheryl were saying, I should get care, but I earned it, and these other people did not, and it's not my responsibility to pay for their coverage. That is a, a common um, belief that you will hear. It's, it's, it's a big dividing line. There is no agreement there about how that should be treated. And that leads to the second point, which is what we talked about with who deserves care. And there is this, this ethic that, you know, Ruth was talking a little bit about where you earn or you work for care and otherwise people are seen as, as paying for care who people who haven't earned it or who haven't worked as hard. That is, um, you know, a very common idea. Um, I worked on the Children's Health Insurance Program back in 2001. And part of why I did that was because um, at the time, it was viewed as um, a stepping stone to universal coverage. So if we can agree to provide coverage for children that looks a little bit different than Medicaid, then you know maybe we start to incrementally bring in their parents and then we start to bring in other adults. And, and so that was partly what drew me to CHIP. And at that point, CHIP was a bipartisan program. There was a lot of agreement on all sides that insurance for children was important. And we don't have that anymore. So we were supposed to reauthorize CHIP um, at the end of September of this year. Um, I don't even know the current numbers. It's around 10 million children on CHIP across the country whose families make a little bit too much for Medicaid but still don't have insurance coverage. So at one point, those children were viewed as deserving of coverage, as a good investment um, of coverage, and they were covered in their states through CHIP with extra money. So we don't have that anymore. We have kids who may not get coverage. The state of Colorado is looking at ending their program pretty quickly because it's on an allotment system. So states get a certain amount of money. And once that's gone, if it's not reauthorized, they're out of money and they, they may or may not be able to cover those kids. So that's changing too. Like we, we can't even agree that children deserve <coughs> coverage. So that's, that's not a good sign. Um, the third thing that I don't think anyone has said yet, but uh, underpins a lot of the debate in America is 
there are a lot of people who think government is bad. There is a contentious relationship with government. So there are people, you know, we worked in government, who, who believe that you can work with and through government to achieve better things. There are also people who view things going to the government as failure. So um, they view government work as um, subpar. I think that's a big part of this current administration, thinking that um, the private sector, that the market provides a better solution than government solutions. And that underpins a lot of what we see. Um, I worked in South Dakota as the Medicaid director. And